judgment and death, we thank you that he is now at your right hand. And we pray, O oh Lord, that your blessing would be on us, that your spirit would strengthen us for worship, that you would equip us with faith to receive your word and to walk in the power of the spirit. We ask for your blessings on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's remain standing and we'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
our scripture readings this morning, we want to begin taking a look at Psalm 22, verses 1 through 22. Psalm 22, this is a remarkable psalm written by David about the year 1000 BC, a thousand years before the coming of Christ. And yet his words here depict almost verbatim what Christ went through on the cross. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like the potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Now, the words of the prophet Isaiah in the 53rd chapter of his prophecy, once more pointing us to the cross of Jesus Christ and the meaning of that cross as he suffered there for us. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 12. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall, be, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will make many to be accounted righteous, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And finally, these words from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 15, verses one through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according, in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for the message of salvation, the word of the gospel message that has come to us over these many years later. We thank you that we have heard of Jesus, who was innocent and undefiled, and like a lamb was led to the slaughter. We thank you that you were pleased to place on him the sins of all your people, that we might be spared the wrath of God and be set free for everlasting life. We thank you, Father, for the work of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he was obedient to you to the point of death, even the death on the cross. And we pray, O Lord, that as we reflect on his death and his resurrection, that your spirit would bless our hearts, that we would see the accomplishment of our redemption and know that we are secure in Christ because of what he has done for us. We pray, Lord, that your blessing would be on us, that you would fill our hearts with hope, with faith and love, that we might serve you in our world today 
and that we will be prepared for that glorious day when he will return to raise the dead and to bring us everlasting life. We pray, Lord, that you would minister to our church and to its needs. We thank you for your care and provision for us. We pray that you would be with the Kimmels as they are traveling and visiting with family and friends and seeking to uh, uh, express the, the comfort of the gospel and the peace of God in Christ Jesus. Pray, Lord, that your blessing would be on them. Pray, Lord, that you would uh, give them safety in their travels and a speedy return home. And we do pray that you would comfort them as well, strengthen them with the hope of the gospel and the promise of everlasting life. We pray, Lord, that you, you would be with Aaron and Heather Boxstein as they travel uh, home from their vacation in Florida. We pray, Lord, that you would give them safety in their travels, bless their time together as this was uh, a special trip for their children. We pray, Lord, that your blessing would be on that and that uh, Abigail and Ethan would uh, appreciate the time that they were able to spend with their parents. Uh, Lord, we pray that you, your blessing would be on them. We thank you for your care and provision for our elderly over this past week, keeping them from harm and from evil, and we pray that you would continue to watch over each one, sustain and strengthen them by your grace, help them to be strong in spirit, ever knowing the power of Christ in the midst of uh, great weakness. Father, we pray that you would be with those of us who are yet working and laboring in your vineyard. We pray that you grant us grace and strength to serve you, bless our efforts, prosper us in our work. We pray, Lord, that you would provide for our needs and uh, take care of us. We pray for our extended families, uh, those for whom we uh, love and care. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them and we pray that this day your gospel would reach each one, that they would receive the saving news of Jesus Christ the forgiveness of sins and everlasting life in him. Father, we pray for your blessing in our church that we would flourish and grow with your blessing and we ask for your presence with us this day. We ask in Jesus' name. And we ask that you would teach us to pray even as the Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen.
direct your attention to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3. I'll read the first 16 verses of the chapter. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share, in, share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the experiences of the Apostle Paul and his testimony to us. We pray that you would impress upon our hearts his love for you and uh, kindle within us that same overwhelming desire to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's been a considerable interest in recent years, over the past 30 years, I guess, in uh, power evangelism. The uh, movement has developed through the vineyard churches. I don't know if you've ever come across one of those, but vineyard churches and uh, groups that are associated around them. Uh, John Wimber has written a book on power evangelism in which he talks about the importance of uh, evangelism being not merely in word, but also in deed. Indeed, the, what he is looking for is evangelism with signs and wonders confrontations of spiritual forces uh, and, and casting out of demons and healing folks and all kinds of unusual activities occurring. This is power evangelism. And many have been swept up in this kind of movement. Indeed, I looked at the website for Vineyard Churches last night and they are a worldwide outreach with some 300,000 uh, members across the world. I believe there are 600 of these vineyard churches here in the United States and others, of course, around the world. So it's a very uh, expansive movement. 
I think we as Christians sometimes feel that we need more power for our daily living. We feel very weak in the face of the various temptations that we deal with in the course of life. We're continually falling prey to different uh, temptations and sins, and we are continually looking at the world around us and seeing the great uh, powers at work in our world today. And we wonder, what can I do to effect change in my world? It just seems to be beyond me. I go to the polls and vote. I advocate for others. I write letters to my new newspaper. I do all kinds of things to try to effect change in my world today. But who am I? What can I do? I feel quite weak. And so some gravitate to uh, religious expressions, power religion, as one uh, uh, book uh, describes it, power religions, religions that emphasize great supernatural experiences that dazzle and uh, amaze. Should we be seeking those kinds of things? Well, the Apostle Paul urged the church at Ephesus to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We looked at that last week. We saw that uh, in that chapter, Paul begins with an exhortation to power for the Christian life and then uh, brings that to a conclusion after discussing the Christian armor with prayer. And so power and prayer come together here uh, to uh, equip us for service in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are exhorted to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And the language here Paul uses, the multiplication of terms, which is common for Paul, continually piles up adjectives, as it were, to try to impress his point upon us. This uh, piling up of uh, words in the Greek language, uh, strength, uh, might, power, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Uh, these words uh, are, are words which occur in other places as well in, in, in this epistle. In Greek, uh, the words are based on the Greek words for dunamis, which you might hear the word dynamite. Uh, and then kratos, uh, uh, strength, and iskis, uh, which is also uh, strength or power. And the, with these three Greek words, Paul uh, urges the church to be strengthened for spiritual warfare against the principalities and powers that are all around us. You might note that this a concluding exhortation to the church here in Ephesians 6 is bound or anticipated in the first chapter as Paul introduces his letter in the prayer that he has for the church. And as you get towards the end of that chapter, he makes use of these same three Greek words to, to uh, be part of his petition for uh, his congregation, that they would know the power of his, of the strength of his might. And so, this was a great concern for the Apostle Paul that we be strong in the Lord. When he was uh, speaking with his disciple Timothy, who would serve in Ephesus uh, at a later point in time, uh, he counseled him to pursue godliness. He said physical discipline is good and necessary, but godliness brings much more to you. It brings contentment and has uh, a reward for life eternal. And so Paul's concern was not so much with physical strength and might or power, but it was spiritual power, the power of a godly young man or young woman. We are called to exercise power and strength. In Philippians chapter 3, this language of power comes to the surface again in the 10th verse where Paul says he wishes to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Here, uh, the, 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 the metaphor changes from the metaphor of warfare, which we find in Ephesians chapter 6, where we do battle with the forces of darkness, to a metaphor now of Olympic contest. Uh, it, it is the idea of someone who is running a race that is set before them, and they are straining to reach the prize. Uh, I've 
than watching some Olympic athletes, athletes and hearing the testimony of some, some of them as they run, especially these long distance runners, uh, these marathon runners. And they say that as they're uh, finishing their race, their body is racked with pain, but they don't give up. They keep running, they keep moving until they finally cross that finish line. And that's the, the image of uh, strength and endurance and suffering that Paul has in mind here as he exhorts the church at Philippi to know the power of Christ's resurrection. There is an amazing confluence here of the power of God at work within the resurrection and sufferings which occur in the course of life. We'll note, first of all, in Philippians 3, verse 10, that there's a rather unexpected order to Paul's words here. We typically anticipate Paul speaking of the death of Christ and our union with Christ in his death and then experiencing his resurrection. That is a chronological view of our union with Christ. Christ died and then he rose from the dead. But what you find here in Philippians 3, 10 is an emphasis, first of all, on the resurrection of Christ. Paul wishes to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And it's that resurrection power, then, that qualifies what comes after that. The fellowship in his sufferings, being conformed to, him, to, to his death, the likeness of his death, so that he might somehow attain to the resurrection. What Paul is saying, I think, is that our experience of life in this world is characterized by suffering and death. We are united to Christ in his sufferings and death. And so any sense of a triumphalist view of the power of Christ at work within us needs to be checked and cautioned by his description of our experience in this age. It is an age of suffering and being conformed to the death of Christ. That will be a regular part of our experience. Indeed, as you look at Paul's uh, letters in general, you find that suffering was very much uh, a part of his earthly ministry. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 29, he speaks of how he, is, he toils and struggles on behalf of uh, his, his congregations that they might know Christ. And so this striving, this agony, is the underlying Greek word, in, in fact, this agony for serving Christ was the hallmark of Paul's ministry. If you look as well at 2 Corinthians chapters 4 and 5, you find there as well, in chapter 4, he reverses the many sufferings that he underwent. He was persecuted, pressed down, but not destroyed, persecuted, um, he, but not discouraged, not, he doesn't give up. In all these different experiences of suffering that he endures, he experiences support, an amazing support, life. In the fifth chapter, he says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Death is at work in us, but life in you. He's dying daily. But in the midst of that, in the midst of his own great weakness, the resurrection power of Christ is at work, holding him up. And he says, momentary light affliction is producing us for us an eternal weight of glory. And so, returning to Philippians 3, where Paul urges us to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, it is this resurrection power that enables us to endure through earthly sufferings, sufferings that come to us by virtue of our union with Christ. And how do those sufferings come to us? Well, certainly with Paul, it was through the, the hostile acts of enemies Times he was beaten, he was, in, he was shipwrecked, and all the rest of it. But there were other kinds of stresses that he underwent. He went through sleepless nights and went without food and went hungry at periods of time. In Philippians chapter 3, he says he knows what it means to uh, be abased and to abound. He's learned contentment in every circumstance in life. Why? Because uh, he's able to do all things through him who strengthens him. Christ is able to strengthen him in the midst of all the circumstances of life. And so it is for you and I, as we pass through this life, 
and endure many things, whether it be the weakness of our bodies or the uh, affliction that we face in view of our union with Christ, we have an undergirding power at work within us, a resurrection power of Christ that enables us to endure these things and indeed to flourish. This power of Christ is at work within us by virtue of the fact that we have come to know Christ. Here is the great center of this great work. Paul's concern is not with the power for living so much as knowing Christ. And in knowing Christ, he will have this great power at work in his life. And so his focus is in understanding and knowing Christ, the one who has shown great patience in rescuing him, delivering him from sin, and giving him everlasting life. He wishes to know him. If any of you take the opportunity not merely to uh, read the scriptures and to meditate on what they say to us of Christ, but also, excuse me, also seek to read the various theological discussions that have developed over the centuries with regard to the person and work of Christ, you'll find that knowing Christ is a great challenge. There is so much to understand. Often I have urged you to have a not merely a theoretical knowledge of Christ, but have a personal relationship with Christ, to walk with him, to pray to him, to obey him, to have your life organized in such a way that everything leads to Christ, to his glory. But we also need to be reminded that we need to know Christ as he's presented in the scriptures and understand just who this Jesus is. Is he the second member of the Trinity, the Son of God? The pre-existent son who entered into this world. Is he the one who lived a sinless life? Is he the one whose perfect righteousness is communicated to us through faith? And is he the one that conquered our enemies, sin, death, and the devil himself at the cross when he died as a substitute for our sin? Do we understand these things about Jesus? There needs to be a certain knowledge of who Christ is so that we are sure that we are following the true Christ. Years ago, I remember as a boy watching television, black and white TV, yes, way back. <laughs> we actually had to go up to the TV and turn the knob on to get it to work. <laughs> but there was a program on, and I, I, my memory is that it was called What's My Line? I'm not certain if that was the name of it, but it was a panel of three people and they would have three guests there and they had to figure out who this person was. And believe at the end of the, the, the questions and answers, they went back and forth. The, the, the moderator of this little bit of a debate would say, will the real John Doe please stand up? And one would start up and come down, and another would get up and come down, and finally the real John Doe would stand up. And then, ah, oh, you're him. And then they would talk to him a little bit more because he was a rather unusual person, had a particular experience. In the spiritual world, we need to know who the real Jesus is because there are a lot of false Christs in the world today. Many of our modern pulpits are filled with a false Christ, a Christ who is not true to the scriptures. He is a good example for us, but he's not the object of our faith. He is one who is uh, uh, one who understands the divine consciousness perhaps more than others do, but he's not himself the eternal son of God who entered into this world so that we who are fallen creatures might be redeemed. We who are not God in any way, shape, or form. You see, in our modern age, there are many false Christs in the world today. Jehovah's Witnesses consider him to be an angel who entered into the world. Who is this Jesus? And do you know him? Paul wanted to know this Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Power for Christian living comes through knowing Christ and understanding who he is and what he requires of us. Then we can live that renewed life. And this power is, let's put it this way, eschatological. It is monumental, earth-shaking, overwhelming power. 
It's the power of one who was dead for three days and rose up from the grave, who had the tomb wide open before him and walked out and revealed himself to many disciples over many different situations and proved that he was alive. He even sat down and ate a piece of fish with his disciples. And then in that physical body, he ascended into heaven. This is power. But with that resurrection, he has, if you will, unleashed the forces of the eternal age into this world. The kingdom of God has come in power. The Apostle Paul says that there is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There's a great transformation of the world now because Christ has ascended to heaven, because Christ has poured out his spirit, and we are baptized with the spirit, a spirit of power. And so the forces of the eschaton are at work. We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God's own beloved son. This is a realm of power. And there's a new power, a new life at work within us because of our union with Christ. I say that this is eschatological power in the sense that it has been unleashed with the cross and resurrection of Christ it works its way out through the course of these, this age, but we experience it provisionally in this day. We only have a sense or a taste of that power. We are beset with weakness. We are always struggling. Our full experience of that great power awaits the return of Christ and the new heavens and the new earth then we will have immortal bodies. We will live forever and ever. We will have a new kingdom in which to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there is a great power at work in the resurrection and it's come to us through Christ. It's eschatological power, provisional, yes, but permanent and ongoing. So we have this great provision of grace given to us in Christ. We have great power for our daily experience so that as we face various struggles in the course of life, we have an undergirding power to meet those things. Is there a habit of sin that you have to continually contend with? Christ gives you the power to overcome. Is there uh, various challenges that work that you have to deal with? difficult personalities, different situations in life, Christ gives you the power to endure all these different things. It's the power of the resurrection. It's the power that comes through knowing Christ. Well, let me conclude with this. Uh, over this past week, one who is known for considerable physical power, Arnold Schwarzenegger, a uh, great bodybuilder uh, and uh, went on to a, a great career as an actor and then a less than great career as a governor. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger underwent surgery this week to repair a heart valve. You might not be aware of it, but actually this is the second time he's had heart surgery. Uh, back in about 2003, I think it was, he had surgery at that time because he has a, a degenerative valve in his heart. And he discovered this when he took his mother uh, back in the 1970s to uh, the hospital in Los Angeles to have heart surgery and there he learned that this was genetic. And the doctors told him you need to be checked out for this as time goes on because there may come a time when you will need this new valve replaced as well and sure enough I think it's in 2003 he had it replaced and ordinarily it goes for 10, 12 years or so, then you have to get that replaced again. Well, his lasted a little bit longer, but now he had to get it replaced. He's also had hip replacement surgery. He had rotator cuff surgery. Um, he's been through a lot at 70 years of age now. Physical strength does some good, but godliness is far better as it brings us hope of everlasting life. The power of the resurrection is far more important 
than power lifting. The power of the resurrection is much more effective at bringing us through the experiences of life. It can help us when the body is weak. It can strengthen our faith, quicken our hope, fix our eyes on the eternal age, and help us look forward to that glorious day that is yet to come. The power of the resurrection is at work. Let's uh, rest in that great power. Let's pray. Father, we pray that your blessing would be on us as we remember the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ and the impact that that has had on us as we are made new and empowered by him to live for the glory of God, to live new lives uh, in obedience to Christ. We pray that your blessing would, would be on us that more and more we would know you and the power of your resurrection. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond to God's mercies and grace to us by bringing before him our morning tithes and offerings. Stand and sing praise to God for all of his blessings to us. Let's stand and sing. for your faithfulness and providing for our earthly needs and we pray that as we give ourselves and these offerings to you that you would be glorified in them and that you would advance your work in this place and around the world we thank you for christ and for his great work for us grant us grace to trust in him we pray in his name amen please remain standing right yes
Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.